Hi everyone, this is Jim. Welcome to this uh, Blitz Chess postmortem video. This is a postmortem of my uh, Blitz Chess game number 53, where I played uh, e4. My opponent played the Sicilian defense, and we went into the uh, unusual O'Kelly variation. So let's, let's take a look at it. e4, c5, the Sicilian, knight f3, the normal move here. And uh, instead of uh, d6 or knight c6 or e6, uh, these are all the typical moves, even g6, the hyper-accelerated dragon. Oh, I've seen before, but uh, a6 is quite unusual. I have actually seen this before. So this is called the O'Kelly variation, and the only thing I know about it is that um, you're supposed to, or one idea against the O'Kelly is to play c3 and go into a c3 Sicilian. Now the problem for me is that uh, I normally play uh, the open Sicilian line, so after d6 or e6 I will play the move d4. Um, but uh, d4 is just not as good in this situation, and I'm not entirely sure why. I'm just taking the word of the uh, opening book and what I've read for this. Um, so uh, so the story goes, you're supposed to play uh, c3 and get into a line of the c3, c3 Sicilian, where this uh, move a6 here was just sort of a wasted move, and so you're a tempo up on some of these lines um, if this move turns out to be uh, useless. <clears throat> And of course, uh, a6, if you go into the standard open lines, is, uh, is a common move in the knight orphan and many other lines. So it's a useful move if you just play an ordinary open Sicilian. So that's, that's probably the main difference. So, uh, so I, I knew that much, and I played c3. The problem for me is I don't play the c3 Sicilian, so I don't know how uh, the rest of it goes, and I was just sort of winging it from here. But, uh, you know, that's, chess is all about uh, learning, right? So my opponent played d5. Oh, I guess the other point is that that's an example of why it's uh, useful to know more than one opening because sometimes your opponent will play some move which uh, uh, is best refuted in a different opening. So if you know a variety of openings, you can choose the opening to suit the occasion. So, so the more openings you have, you know, it's sort of like more, more weapons in your armory. Anyway, he follows up a d5. Uh, looks like uh, it's one of the most common moves. Also e6 right up there. Uh, d6 and knight f6 are more Sicilian type moves. d6, knight f6 would transpose into other other lines of the Sicilian. So, but d5, and then you take it, and he takes back with the queen. And black here is taking advantage of your move c3. Uh, you can't put the knight on c3, which you'd like to, to chase that queen away. But uh, So it's perfectly safe for black to take back with the queen in these lines. So you put your pawn on d4, and then he develops with knight c6. So we're out of the opening book here. And I'll just use the uh, notation tab. Uh, I'm not going to turn the computer on. This was kind of a, a long game, and I'll, I'm just going to race through some parts. And uh, there was one interesting tactic, which was uh, probably too deep to make a decent quiz, although you guys can, can think about the position if you want to. But I, I went ahead and uh, charted out the variations, because they were, they were pretty interesting, and I'll, I'll just show you them. OK, so I'm showing up the center here so I can take back with a piece. I didn't want to create an isolated queen spawn, but uh, the computer did prefer that quite a bit. And um, so after C takes, um, you know, I have an isolated queen spawn, but I have uh, good development, and um, black is still a couple moves away from castling. And uh, so it should be better for white to take that. The way I did this with knight takes um, allows him to play this move e5 and, and exchange queens. And now the computer thinks black is slightly better. So it went from being uh, in favor of uh, white to being in favor of black in the space of a couple moves there. And the main, the main culprit was this uh, failing to take on d5. So um, that's, that's for the future. I'll, I'll remember that. <clears throat> but uh, you got to play the game you're playing. So, uh, so black is slightly better along here. But the, the lead shifts back and forth. The computer thought this move f3 was a little, f6 rather, thought this move f6 was a little slow and that um, black should just keep uh, developing his pieces to keep the strongest advantage. So, so it's about even along here. And uh, even uh, white, white starts to get some advantage back. And uh, one, one way I was able to maintain a slight advantage was with this move um, bishop e6 check. I was sort of proud of myself for finding this during the game. This pawn is under attack with his knight. Black had logically advanced his pawns and tried to create some weaknesses here, and now he's attacking them. So very logical game plan from Black. And if I play a passive move like knight to uh, a2 or rook to 
Knight to h2 or rook to uh, g1 to support the pawn, you know, it just uh, deactivates my pieces. It's sort of the opposite of what you want to do. Uh, I was able to find this move, bishop e6 check, which defends a pawn and puts the bishop on an active square. So that's that's a good kind of move to be able to find during a game. And um, we continue on. There's a trade of rooks. And I'm happy to trade pieces because my queen, my king here is a little less secure. There's a cloud of black pieces as well as an extra pawn around my king here. So I want to keep them at bay. And uh, the fewer pieces there are, the more the king is able to defend himself. So I'm happy to see some of these trades. And it's uh, this position right here. You know, you can treat as a tactical quiz if you want. I'm going to go through some of the options. Uh, but uh, there's there's a good move for uh, white, according to the computer. And it's not, uh, maybe the move itself is kind of obvious, but it's not not obvious how it wins. <laughs> so uh, so I charted the whole thing out here. So you want to pause the video and then take a look at it if you haven't already seen the answer on the right. Um, you can do that. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and start explaining some of the variations. So the recommended move by the computer is rook d7 check. And uh, okay, it's a logical move. You're invading. But you have to remember that your, your knight is under attack. So at some point, you're going to have to move this knight or you're going to lose it. And uh, this is a check, but it doesn't actually win anything. At first, I thought, uh, well, maybe this rook is forking the king and the bishop, but the bishop is defended. So, uh, so it's not winning any material, not right away. Um, the king has only two squares to go to, however. The, the knight's covering these squares and the rook's covering this whole row. So uh, he can go to either b8 or c8. And the best move is b8, but is that right? Let's, let's take a look at what happens if he goes to b8. Yeah, yeah, there's a problem with c8. If he goes to c8, we'll, we'll, we'll eliminate this first. Um, for one thing, you could take this bishop with check and, and uh, you would be up in material, wouldn't you? No, no, he can't. <clears throat> it's complicated. No, no, that would work if you were to take the bishop with check. And then you've got one rook and four pieces and he has one rook and three pieces. But the computer line goes knight d6 check, bishop takes d6. I guess this is even stronger. And then rook h7 check. So you're using this discovered check to uh, win the rook in the corner. So your whole rook up in that line. Not a whole rook up, but actually you gave up a piece. You, you have a rook and three pieces and he has four pieces. So you're up the exchange in this line, but you're invading. Okay, <laughs> so that's, uh, that's if he plays king c8. So his best move is king b8. And then you can follow this up with uh, knight a5. So that uh, gets your knight out of take here. But actually, uh, his knight can take your knight. So you're moving it from one place where a pawn can take it to a place where a knight can take it. So what's the point? Well, the point is, after he takes the knight, he undefended his bishop. Um, but you throw in this move, bishop a7 check. King goes to c8. Okay, well, let's look at what happens if king goes to a8 first. This is cute. This is a mate in about eight moves, but... Uh, you can see that the outlines of the mate are the rook, the bishop, and then this bishop here on this diagonal is mating. So uh, you start with bishop d5 check. He has to interpose a piece. You take with the rook. And uh, now he attacks his your bishop, so you can't just move the rook away, which would be checkmate because he takes the bishop. So you have to reposition your bishop, and then he gets, uh, oh, he gets to attack your rook. So you move the rook out of the way. He interposes, and you take it. He checks you. He's just wasting time now. You just get out of the checks. He goes back here. You take the bishop. And then finally, you take his other rook, and this is checkmate. So you see, finally see the checkmate here. That bishop is guarding that square. That bishop is guarding that square. And the rook is guarding the whole row. So a picturesque mate with those three pieces. And uh, so you maybe could have spotted that at this point. And uh, after bishop a7 check, you move your king to c8. So now what's the situation? We have a rook. We have um, three pieces, and black has a rook and four pieces. So uh, you take the bishop. So now the material is even, and uh, your only advantage here is just the, the better placement of your pieces. You're just sort of swarming around the, the black king here. And this was a discovered check, so the king has to move. So he goes to d8. Then you move the rook to g7, attacking this bishop. And when the bishop moves out of the way, then you can play bishop b6 check forking 
orking the king and the knight and picking up a piece. So then you're a piece up and uh, winning the game. So uh, anyway, a pretty interesting tactic. So back back to the game. Here uh, my opponent played uh, b5, and instead of uh, playing this rook d7 line, which I think is uh, it's probably pretty difficult even for a strong player to spot in a blitz game. <laughs> Although you never know. Uh, sometimes these guys spot some amazing tactics. So I played the, the more reasonable move, knight b6, with the idea of coming here and with check. So I do that. And, um, you know, I'm just trying to exchange off some pieces. And there is a tactic right here after check. And king moves away. Um, and maybe you can spot this one. I, I didn't see it at this point, and then I noticed it a move later, and, or a move or two later, and played it. So, uh, so see if you can spot the tactic in this position. It's white's turn to move. And this is one you, you might be able to see. It's, it's a common kind of thematic tactic. So um, it's worth looking for. Pause the video if you want more time. I'm going to give the answer away. Um, the idea is you first take this knight, uh, bishop, with your knight. He takes back. And then you can grab one of these pawns. Say you grab this one. And if he takes, then you can take this pawn, and you're forking the two knights. So if we back up to the position in the game, um, that's what the idea is. You need to trade away this bishop first to get a knight on this square. And once you have a knight on this square and a knight on this square, a bishop here will fork the two of them, and neither of them are defended. Um, so you just need to clear out the pawns, and you can sacrifice the knight to clear out the pawns. So you take here or here. Um, so let's go ahead and I'll show you how I played it in the game. He went, uh, he went king b7. I went rook h1 to attack his knight here because I, I hadn't spotted the tactic yet. And I saw it in this position, I think. And while he was deciding how to defend his knight, I was looking at the board and I noticed that tactic there. So then I went ahead and took the bishop, like I said, and then I took this pawn. And this, if he takes back, uh, wins a piece. Uh, no, no, wins two pawns. I get my piece back and I'm just two pawns up. Um, so actually, after taking the pawn, his best move is not to take back, but just to uh, do something else. I didn't look at what it was. Basically anything except taking that knight, because you don't want to allow a bishop to land on that square. So... Um, an improvement suggested by the computer is not to take this pawn, but to take this pawn. Because you think about the case where uh, Black refuses to fall for the tactic. He wants to just go uh, one pawn down instead of two pawns down. Which of these pawns would you rather have? And basically the center pawn here is a more important pawn. Um, so it's better off to take here. And it, it's the same tactic if he takes, then you have bishop takes here, forking the two pieces. But anyway, the way it was played, I took this one. Pawn takes, bishop takes, it's still a good tactic. And uh, he just could have played better by not taking my knight. <clears throat> so he tried to get tricky here by attacking my bishop, moving his piece, but it uh, just turns out that nothing works. I can trade the bishop, his knight comes back. I trade rooks, his knight gets out of the way, and then I can grab the knight. So I'm just the uh, two pawns up that I won, and I have a bishop versus a knight. So this is a straightforward technical win, as they say, but it took... <laughs> It took a long time during the game, um, so I'll just kind of go through it. There were no big mistakes here. I mean, basically, I'm maintaining a slight edge through all of this. And with two extra pawns widely separated, um, you know, the knight can't stop both of them, so the king has to stop one and the knight has to stop the other. <clears throat> and you just um, march them forward carefully and just need to make sure you don't get uh, forked at some time or other. And um, there's, there's no way to stop the eventual progress of these pawns. Um, and your king can go back and forth. For example, if the knight is blockading over here and his king is blockading over here, you can uh, use your king to chase the knight away. And, and uh, if his king comes over to defend, then you advance his pawn to keep his, his king blocked down. So you have to play both pawns forward to make progress in this, in this endgame. But I am... Oops... We raced ahead till the end there, sorry. Let's back up. It was a long game. <laughs> so we were somewhere around here. So the pawns just 
creep forward carefully, step by step, inch by inch. And uh, here you see the idea of transferring the king to the other side to chase the knight away so you can make progress there. And now I came up with the idea, which actually uh, is approved by the computer, oddly enough. It, it seemed kind of risky at the time. I want to push this pawn through, and if he takes the pawn over here, um, if he takes this pawn, it's hopeless because I'll just take his knight. And then the queen and the pawn will win easily. I mean, the bishop and the pawn will win easily. Um, so, he, But if he takes this pawn, I can advance this to a queen um, before the knight can get back to uh, cover the queening square. So I just ad advance that pawn, and uh, he throws in a check, and then he grabs the pawn, which was pretty clever because now he can take the bishop with check. I hadn't spotted this. So I push the pawn ahead. He grabs my bishop. And now I have to be careful here, but um, notice that the only square his uh, knight can, um, the squares that his knight can get to that um, uh, cover the queening square are these squares. So I just have to make sure he can't get to one of those squares with tempo. Um, because it takes him two moves to get to those squares, and I'm only one move away from queening. So I played king to f6, um, and he goes there with check. <laughs> and I step out of the way, and then I get my queen. So let's back up. Is there, is there a swifter way to do this? Now, I can't go to this square right now because uh, he's covered by the uh, knight. And maybe going to this square is a little bit smoother because I don't get checked here. Um, the knight, if he's trying to get to this square, which is the only square he can get to to stop the pawn, he's still, he's still one square too late. And this would win yeah, more quickly, because that would check would pick up the knight. So um, <clears throat> that would have been a swifter way to uh, handle it. I went king f6. He gets one more check. Finally, I move my king to a square where he can't check me, and uh, he has no square he can go to to stop the pawn from queening. This square is the only one he can get to and my king is guarding it. So I get a queen and now we have a queen versus knight endgame which is actually um, not that hard. It's hard to win um, a queen versus rook endgame. It's possible but difficult. Um, queen versus knight or queen versus bishop is actually easy um, but it can be tricky. It's easier with the bishop because, uh, you know, if you have a dark squared bishop, you just stay on the light squares. <laughs> and if you have a light squared bishop, you just stay on the dark squares and, and uh, chase the king around and t to a corner and mate it. But uh, with a knight, the knight can cover both color complexes. And, um, and so it's tricky. You just have to, every move, you have to be careful that you're not uh, walking into a fork of some kind. But the main idea is to uh, confine the king to a smaller and smaller space and to pin the knight whenever you get the chance. That forces the king to move because he's only got two pieces and uh, whenever the knight is pinned, the king is going to have to move. So you can use that to drive the king around and you use your pieces to cover some of the squares the knight can go to. And you just chase the king into the corner. And after he's confined into the corner, then there's always going to be some kind of mate there. Uh, in this case, uh, we got into this situation. I just stepped forward to my king, and now there's a threat of queen here, mate, or there. Either of those squares is mate. And uh, the only thing he can do is move his knight. His king actually has no moves. And um, so if he moves his knight to either this square, let's erase these guys. If he moves his knight to either this square or this square, I just checkmate him. So he went to the other square, which is check, it buys him one one moment of time, but I just take the knight, and now his king only has one move, and then it's checkmate the next move. So that is game over, and uh, that's how you play that kind of end game. So a little bit of instructive stuff in this game, kind of a long, but actually pretty well played game, especially considering it was a blitz game. So I uh, hope you guys enjoyed that. Leave any comments you have in the section below, and I will see you again soon. Bye.